Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, a land so ancient yet so new and undiscovered. Well, that's at least for the vast majority of the world's population. Perhaps what most people know about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is that it's the birthplace of Islam, world's second largest religion, and that it's the main contributor to the oil industry, of course, with a quarter of the world's proven reserves just under its deserts. And perhaps that it's a strict country that oppresses its citizens, at least the female ones, and it's related or contributes directly to terrorism. A stereotype that is far from the truth, and unfortunately, not much is known for this golden land. How would people know and learn of a country so closed on itself, yet so welcoming to almost everyone? And the world's media isn't helping either, for when tackling most of the news related to Saudi Arabia, it's either negative, biased, scary, or untrue. Many people may not be familiar with Saudi's genuine nature, culture, tradition, social life, educational level, financial status, the dreams and hopes for the future, and the silent fights that cultivated our path. For that, something must be done. Iodine, a strategic communication business, has came up with an educational program in collaboration with King Faisal's Foundation for Research and Islamic Studies at Gateway to KSA. We're bringing students from all around the world to come and visit Saudi Arabia for a nine-day educational program. I'm really passionate about this project simply because I think there's a big misunderstanding and misconception about the country and I think when people actually come and visit Saudi they realize there's so much more to it and it's so different to what you read in mass media and all the fake news that's out there about the country that experience it experiencing Saudi firsthand is the best way really to uh, to really get to know it. One of the the most exciting things to watch is um, the interaction between local Saudi students or local Saudi families with international students and seeing how they um, they interact with one another and um, the, the joy they have and the questions that they get to ask um, and really get a better understanding of the people. I was quite nervous when I first, on my first visit to Saudi Arabia, I, um, I'd obviously read things in the media and um, didn't know what to expect, um, particularly um, I was worried I was going to offend somebody or not dress correctly or uh, not be covered properly. Um, but uh, it was pretty relaxed actually when I arrived and people are so incredibly friendly. They welcomed me with open arms and the hospitality has just been incredible since the very first time I came. Every single time I come, people are extremely welcoming. Nalika's preliminary perception of Saudi Arabia is widely spread. And we wanted to test that theory, so we asked the students participating in this trip to share their true feelings on coming to Saudi Arabia. I think Saudi Arabia in Australia is perceived as obviously somewhere quite foreign to us, um, somewhere quite different to, you know, the way that we live in our culture. Um, I guess it's just, just a foreign country that, that sort of operates in a different way to what we do. People perceive it as being a very valuable regional player in the Middle East, but also are pretty critical of the role that it's had in regional conflicts. Among people who have less knowledge about international affairs, I think that their perceptions of Saudi range from that it's very mysterious, they don't really know much about it, to being a little bit afraid and unsure of its safety. There honestly isn't a perception because people don't know. They just think, oh, it's in the Middle East, maybe? They, no one really knows. I think Considering that I live in the South, there's a lot of common misconceptions about Saudi Arabia and most of them tend to be negative. Um, I think people think there's a lot more 
a lot of terrorism in Saudi Arabia and that people aren't hospitable or welcoming. Uh, some people uh, view Saudi Arabia as an important regional ally, while others are concerned with the country is possible links to terrorism and what they view as the oppression of women. I would say the soldier is seen as a partner of the United States in the Middle East and other than what you see on TV or in the news, there's not too much other coverage of the country around here. It doesn't really pop up that much in discussion. It's really hard to say. Uh, we don't hear much about it. Maybe because it's a, like a closed country for visitors, so Brazilians don't talk much about it, so we only know what we hear, like on on it on TV, like news and stuff. If if you ask to Brazilian about Saudi Arabia, maybe they they just have like a little bit of prejudice about all the things that happen in the Middle East, like uh, safety and terrorism, that kind of stuff. And they probably think about like it's a wealthy country because we also know that kind of, like it's a wealthy country. So. You, we, we don't know much about it, that, that's the truth. I think we don't have a lot of knowledge about Saudi Arabia. I mean, we have some news about politics or oil, but we don't know much about the culture because it's really different from ours. And, um, and since it's not a very touristic place either, like Dubai, for example, we don't know much about Saudi Arabia quite close country so we don't really know what is happening there and what we can expect there and it's often I mean, um, promoted by journalists and TVs and so we don't really know clearly what is really happening there so we don't have a clear idea about, about the country. The thing that I'm most worried about um, when visiting the country is sort of the fear that I will offend someone or do something that's considered offensive over there, but to me might seem completely normal. Uh, I'm kind of worried about not being able to speak the language and what that's going to be like. Honestly, I'm worried about customs. I've heard such horror stories about people getting things confiscated or just other things happening that are not very fun or savory, so that's what I'm worried about. Um, it's also been a while since I've taken Arabic. I studied abroad in Jordan, so just worried about my Arabic not being up to par and feeling guilty about it because after three years I should know more than I probably do, but that's okay. I'm excited to visit the uh, birthplace of Islam because I am fairly passionate about Islamic studies, but of course I'm also concerned about being introduced to a foreign culture, which is very different from what I'm used to and that I'm not accustomed to. Since I visited other times, I know that it's not like as dangerous people say, and I really like the, the whole region. So I think the only uh, thing we should be worried about when you when we, we travel there maybe it's just safety. Uh, probably how I'm going to be treated as a woman, because we hear a lot about how different it is for women and men, how they're. Uh, different entrances at public places, how women can talk to men, and um, I'm not sure I'm gonna follow the, rule, the rules correctly. The main thing I'm worried about coming to Saudi Arabia is the security. As you know, I live in Paris and we were a victim of uh, some big attacks a few years ago, so um, security is always my, uh, my main wonder when, uh, when, I, when I'm traveling uh, abroad. So, we have a jam-packed schedule, a program that is designed to take the students on a nine-day educational trip, allowing them to explore Saudi Arabia from a cultural, political, educational and economical perspective. So, let the trip begin! After the students' arrival, the first day of our journey had to be to Al Janadriya Festival. It's an annual celebration that brings different cities in Saudi Arabia all in one place, allowing the visitor to this festival to go north, south, east and west of the kingdom all in one day.
The guests got a wide introduction on Saudi Arabia's culture, our customs, our traditions, our music, and our food. And now, we're getting ready to our next day, which will be a historical introduction to Saudi Arabia. And for that, we're going to Al-Masmak Fort and the old city of al Saudi Arabia's first capital, and now is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The students had too many questions coming to Saudi Arabia, and slowly, they started getting answers for most of them. However, one of their main concerns were related to political matters, so we had to pay a visit to our gracious host, Prince Turki bin Faisal, the chairman of King Faisal's Center for Research and Islamic Studies, who opened both his heart and home to the students. Uh, Gateway KSA is actually the, uh, the, the project of uh, a young lady from uh, Australia who is of Dutch origin. Her name is Nelika Quispel. And uh, she had some friends who uh, visited the kingdom as students from Harvard University a few years back. And uh, she heard so much from them about their visit and how much they enjoyed it that uh, she decided to come to the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies and propose that the center invite uh, students from many universities around the world uh, to come and do a trip uh, in Saudi Arabia. Not only to get, get to know in terms of uh, touristic um, uh, attraction, but also uh, to engage with the Saudi people, Saudi culture, and uh, the Saudi way of life. King Faisal Center for Research in Islamic Studies is a, uh, an institution uh, that is not only a think tank, but it is also uh, a vehicle for uh, engaging with people. Um, its uh, main uh, ethos, if you like, uh, is uh, following in the footsteps of the late King Faisal when he was asked uh, just the day before he died uh, what he thought uh, Saudi Arabia would be like in 50 years. And his answer was that I hope that Saudi Arabia will be a wellspring of radiance for humanity. Prince Turkil Faisal was so open in tackling and discussing two controversial files that face Saudi Arabia in the Western world, Yemen and Iran. 
briefly, in the last five years or so, Yemen went through the so-called Arab Spring, beginning in 2011, and the kingdom with her GCC partners that are Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, the UAE, and Oman, um, uh, worked with uh, the Yemeni uh, government and the international community through the United Nations to establish uh, uh, a, uh, uh, to end the civil war that started in 2011 and begin a, a reform and uh, uh, resettlement uh, program for Yemen. And uh, it's not just on issues of, of uh, building, rebuilding infrastructure, but equally importantly is to meet the human needs. One of the parties to the Yemeni political makeup are called the Houthis. Uh, the Houthis are um, a derivative of a, uh, an Islamic sect, uh, the Shia sect, um, but a very particular derivative of it, very small minority within it, but they have very strong links with Iran. Uh, there was just a couple of days ago, three days ago, a UN report that uh, uh, verified the, the contribution of Iran to the Houthi uh, um, military capability that runs counter to the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2216, which, which called for an embargo of arms to, uh, to the Houthis. One of the first um, statements made by Khomeini when he came to power in 1979 was that he would like to see that all the Shahs in the area deposed, uh, like he succeeded in deposing the Iranian Shah. And of course, he considered the king of Saudi Arabia as a Shah or a king. So we've been living with that um, attitude from Iran since 1979. The point I'm making is that we're bound by our geography. And so we have to deal with these issues because they affect us directly. And we're much closer to these events than Europe or America or Australia or Brazil. So their impact is very much more immediate on us than it is on other places. And that's why in taking actions to meet these challenges that we have around us, sometimes we have to do it in a manner that seems unexplainable or perhaps a bit uh, 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 rash or uh, un, un, uh, unprogrammed. After Prince Turkil Faisal's political talk, we had dinner and we got ready for our next stop in the cities of Saudi Arabia, which was al -Ula. has been really different so far. Um, it's, it's far different than what's portrayed in the media or even in textbooks. It's always portrayed as very political um, and the people don't get along and they're not very nice to foreigners, but so far I've had a great experience. Everybody has been really kind to me and really hospitable and excited to welcome me as an American to Saudi Arabia. At first I was really nervous about coming to Saudi Arabia. Um, I think that I, when I told my friends, they were afraid. They were a little bit scared for me. Um, they told me not to wear anything colorful, um, that I should just wear a black scarf and an abaya all the time. But that hasn't been the case at all. Right now, I'm wearing um, a blue abaya, and 
uh, a white scarf. So it's been really fun and just seeing the different fashions even is far different than what I had expected. Um, I have to say it's a lot different from what I expected. Personally, I thought before coming to Saudi that it was a very conservative country with a lot of rules that really people were not allowed to break. And in that sense, I've been had, I've had my mind changed in that I see women who don't have to wear a niqab all the time. I see women in jeans. I see women who are far more open with uh, showing their faces in public than I think is perceived oftentimes in the United States. And just as a country in general, I think it's a lot different in that uh, the perception of it in the United States is that it's modernizing, but there's a lot of room for it to grow. Whereas coming here, I think I see a lot of similarities between uh, you know, the structure of the cities, the way that they're built, and the similarities in urban areas as well. When I was like coming here, I had always heard a lot of like negative things about Saudi Arabia and my family was actually like being from the south of America, we have a lot of misconceptions about like what is an Arab and especially like, you know, Saudi Arabia is the harbinger of like all of those negative connotations and things like that. So what had happened is like I had all these wrong ideas. I was like, I know like, you know, this isn't the way that they live. and so. I was just kind of like trying to look up all the different types of news, like how are women supposed to act? How am I supposed to act? And like I watched a little coffee video that like taught me this. And so like I learned one ritual, but I didn't know like, I was still told like women aren't supposed to like travel alone or like I was watching a documentary about it and it was saying all these negative things about like, you know, like how women live in Saudi Arabia, you know, and even the royalty, they can be like locked up and not have a choice in like leaving and stuff like that. So like I had no idea coming in. That's all the information that I had access to, you know, so that's what I thought coming here. And that's why I freaked out in the stairwell because I just didn't like, I didn't have any idea. Like from the Saudi women that I've met, from Sarah that I've met, that um, like Saudi women can be progressive and they can have a choice in what they wear and they can have a choice in how they live their lives. But you know, I still have yet to see, you know, like the women living in Jeddah. I've just seen Riyadh and I haven't really interacted with any other Saudi women besides Sarah. But like, you know, um, it just shows that there's like a spectrum of people, just like there's a spectrum of people everywhere that have different ideas and different ways of living. Absolutely. I Last night I got to meet a band of girls called Smile um, <laughs> and at first I was kind of, uh, I was like really interested and I saw them doing their dances and it was very cute but then it made me think they were in like these very cute outfits but I wondered like at what age are they expected to like cover up more or like at what point is that tradition like become part of their life um, because it looks like maybe their moms who were with them were wearing a niqab so that was one question that I have is mm -hmm. like what age does that come about? I think one thing we we're wondering is like definitely about choice you know like whether these women have the option to do those things and I feel like some women have but like something that Sarah said like made me like have another question in that like she was saying that if your family wants you to wear a niqab and your husband wants you to wear a niqab, then there's a problem. But like, she never mentioned like, what if you don't want to wear a niqab? So I was just curious about like, I feel like maybe some women have that choice, but I was wondering, do all women have that choice? I think it makes a lot of sense because uh, after hearing about, I don't know, kind of the economic like move that mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia is like changing towards like diversifying and things like that. Women are going to be part of that mm -hmm. and it's going to be much easier for them to be part of it if they can drive and if they are going to be involved in all the like new aspects of cinema and things like that. In Al Ula, the students got an in-depth insight on Madain Saleh, the world's second largest Nabataean city. It's both magical and enchanting, a well-preserved city that tells the story of an ancient civilization. And now, King Salman decreed it to be established as a major touristic attraction.
just the the way people dress and the culture, the religion is very different for me because in Brazil, you barely see people wearing um, scarves and, and stuff like that. So it is very different. I'm getting used to it already. I don't think it's that strange. When I first when I first arrived, I was kind of shocked, but I I'm getting used to it. Yeah. Today I talked a lot during lunch with Sarah. She's a Saudi girl, and um, she she's someone who's teaching me a lot about the women in Saudi Arabia, because I had no idea, for example, that women could walk without a man, could travel without a man, because traditionally they couldn't. But I mean, she went to Canada for for, for to study alone. So I'm seeing that I had a lot of stereotypes that I'm breaking. And um, I think this is, the, this is the most thing I was interested about, women in Saudi Arabia. So that's what I keep asking everybody about it. So I'm enjoying this discovery. Oh, first of all, I'm very curious. I'm a very curious person, so I'm always very interested in discovering new country, and especially Saudi Arabia, a country that, you know, you... I have never been to Saudi Arabia, there's no tourist visa, so that's why I'm here. And it's just a perfect set for a film. It's, it's amazing. I have the impression to be in another planet or maybe in another world or another century. It's, it's magical. Well, we don't really have any Saudi Arabian film. I mean, I don't think I've seen one. So I have, yeah, it will be very interesting to see Saudi Arabia from, uh, from the eye of, uh, of a Saudi national who will show us the life of, a, of a, you know, of a Saudi citizen and what is your concern, your, your, your problems. I mean, that's what cinema is. It's a view of a person, and it's it's its own perception. So, it doesn't mean that you know some perception it's the country. So, even if I'm um, sure you see American films or French films, it's you you might see something French or American, but it's 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 still it's through the eye of 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 a of, a of the of the person who's making the film. So. Most people don't imagine that a country like Saudi Arabia would have means of entertainment and they wouldn't imagine it to be water activities. So our next stop in this trip will be Jeddah, the coastal city of Saudi Arabia. First time in Saudi? First time in Saudi, yeah, never been here before and um, it's definitely exceeded my expectations, I think. Really? That's definitely, nice yeah. to hear from someone coming from down under? Not what I expected. Yeah, no, there's, there's definitely a lot of similarities, um, especially today going out on the boat, just having like a, a good time with the locals and swimming, doing activities. It's, it's kind of like being at home during summer, so it's really nice. Mm -hmm. uh, what else have you seen in Saudi so far? I've heard um, you're, where you're on a filming trip, you're yeah, doing some so, film production. Yeah, so me and my friend Jack are out here creating some content um, with Gateway 
we've been doing a lot of aerials with drones, um, just a lot of like normal shooting and filming. Um, we started off in Riyadh, mm -hmm. shot the city, like lots of history and stuff like that, which was really cool to see. And then uh, we moved to the desert in, I think, Alula. Alula? You went Alula, to Alula? Alula Great, yeah. that's a nice place. So I've been there, there yeah. We saw um, Elephant Rock. Great. Uh, went camel riding, did all, all sorts of stuff. So I think for me, that was like my favorite park. I need to go off road, four wheel drives, uh -huh. like adventure, just seeing like, seeing things that I've never seen before in my life. Mm -hmm. So like for me, I, I didn't know that that existed and I was, it was crazy, especially all the ancient tombs, mm -hmm. going in and seeing- In that, Medina Saleh, you mean so? Mm, yeah. Seeing all the ancient architecture just in the middle of nowhere, it was crazy. So um, for me, so far, that's been my favorite part. And then obviously today was amazing as well, going out in the water. Um, so yeah, it's been amazing so far. So um, your expectation versus what you've seen. Uh, people think usually of Saudi being a little bit isolated, yeah. the living style. Yeah. So you've seen some of us. Definitely. I think. What definitely, do you think? Yeah, I think definitely before I came, I thought. Saudi was a bit isolated, mainly because one, I'd never been there, and mm -hmm. two, it's it's just a long way from Australia where I live. Mm -hmm. But but after coming here and seeing the people, seeing the area, meeting people from different communities, it's 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 definitely not the case. It's mm -hmm. it's much like anywhere else I've been in the world, which is which is amazing to know and experience, and and something that I hope to share with other people as well. Any food you like specifically? I love the food here. Actually, like I have a lot of um, Lebanese friends at home, so uh -huh. the food is kind of similar. Uh -huh. um, lots of hummus, bread. Uh, salad, stuff like that, so yeah, it's really good. On your next uh, dinner out, you gotta try madfoon. What's that? Madfoon, that's uh, meat done okay. with rice and it's done under high pressure. No way. So it's very, very soft meat. Amazing. You gotta try. That's typically to I'll, local. I'll write it down, I'll make yeah, sure. Yeah, you gotta try it. that out. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Great. As we go further in this trip, the students start changing a lot of their stereotypical views of Saudi Arabia. But one stereotype will not be changed unless the students talk with the locals. Women's right. And who better to clarify this perception other than a handful of successful women from Effet University. So Anna, what I think, to be very honest, at the risk of sounding controversial, when there is smoke, there is fire. You know, so the stereotype you have, it was built up by stories that might have actually happened here. So. We are, in a, in a way, we're privileged. But at the same time, we have to speak about both halves of Saudi. And there are other women who actually are for the guardianship system. They believe they're more protected. They believe that they want it. They want a male guardian. They want to, be, they want to have a, ma a man in charge of their lives. And that's a fact. We have a large percentage of females who actually are for the guardianship system. As much as we don't see the just of it or why does it make sense but that's why. that's why we want the option that's why we want the yeah that's why that's why we want to have it in a way that can fit that, that can fit both yeah a lot of women fought for it and i think that in a lot of ways made the saudi women much stronger because like you said uh, dr malak we didn't go into the streets we didn't protest we had our fight silently who is going to question the human rights and others that do not renew their information. Somebody called me in from the uh, Monaco radio uh, three, four days ago, and I read it in one of the newspapers. I was in the UK. They're saying, uh, Dr. Lama al Suleiman, yes, he says, what do you think of the new law that allows women to have businesses without the consent of the wakil? I go, what? And I just explained to you, this, was ha this happened in 2009. But I had the Monte Carlo radio station call me because a newspaper in the UK had written that Saudi has annulled this policy. This policy has been allowed in 2009. This year, Saudi Arabia issued the, for the first time and we struggled hard. And I tell you, I, can, I have stories for seven years we're pushing for sexual harassment law. It was refused twice in the Shura Council which is like the parliament, refused by uh, voting. And this year, the government decided once they disallowed women to drive, the next morning, the sexual harassment national policy was issued. So even sexual harassment today, so we're moving at par because sexual harassment seems to be a problem everywhere around the world. 
I'm just glad that we issued the policy at the same time as the rest. And we in Saudi today have a national policy for sexual harassment, even though a lot of the developed countries do not have a national law and they leave the sexual harassment policy as part of a corporate policy and not a national law which is in my belief wrong it should be a national policy and not a corporate policy and in the u.s until today it's only a corporate policy maybe a lot of the stereotype we have on your part of the world is because of this pressure we continuously feel to having to please your part of the world on how we try to solve our issues even we acknowledge our weaknesses we see them and maybe we're slower at uh, uh, at actually evolving and finding solution for them because i think the situations we are living are very unique so we have injustices in our world we have harassed women and women that are battered we have somebody who killed a child we have somebody who treated an expat in Saudi badly. We have these stories. And I think the whole world has these stories because courts are full. In the US, it's the highest rate of people in prison. So it's happening. You know, things are happening. But we, unless your generation is going to learn to be a bit more tolerant about what's happening around the world and how people are trying to deal with it, and your generation needs to only measure the amount of development and evolution that is happening in these countries and not fixate itself on one bad story you're destroying a huge amount of citizens and people just by my i don't want my little kids because these little kids come back from school and go mama why don't they like us mama why do we look so bad Mama, well, we don't have to justify all of this. We need the world to be a bit more tolerant. After meeting with Ifat University's ladies, our next stop was an in-depth view of the kingdom's educational level, the brains that will build the future not only locally but internationally. So we had to go to KAUST, King Abdullah's University of Science and Technology. Saudi Arabia's KAUST is ranked amongst the world's most leading universities and it has graduated world's brightest brains. It is recognized by its eco-friendly environment, landscape and magnificent architecture. The message of KAUST has always been we are a global institution, a global uh, university focused on research and focused on education. Yes, it's global, but it's rooted inside Arabia. So it is a Saudi Arabian university, but attracts the globe to come to one place to study, to learn, to work together and show the world that the world can be together and can live together and can work together for the betterness of humanity. I'm sure you already heard we have students from all over the world, over 70, 80 nationalities, and that's maybe one of the uh, largest global diversification of students in one institution. And that diversification and global is part of the DNA of KAUST and that's why we always look for attracting uh, people like yourself. And we look at every student here as a graduate student and as a, 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 a project for making that person the future scientist of the world. We love to dream of every graduate of KAUST when they leave this campus whether they stay in the kingdom or go back home or go anywhere, 
they are there to speak about cows and they are there to be ambassadors for how advanced a new design of education and the research and science is being conducted. A global institution that focuses on education to help change the world and create a better future. This has been the objective of not only KAUST, but also the leaders of Saudi Arabia. And it has been declared clearly through Vision 2030, a roadmap to self-create, optimum education, and full use of all Saudi's resources. Our next stop was a visit to Dammam City. When we reached Dammam, we were welcomed by the Prince Saud bin Nayef, the governor of the Eastern Province, and he was so gracious to openly discuss Saudi's vision and the use of different resources other than the oil. After visiting His Royal Highness, we head to Aramco, Saudi Arabia's National Petroleum and Natural Gas Company. We walked around and met experts who talked about the production of the oil and its industry. While our visit to Aramco, we visited King Abdelaziz Center for World Culture. It's an all-purpose cultural destination that has an environment that promises the visitor a transforming experience in the world of knowledge. Aramco was our last stop, and after learning all about the renewable energy and oil production, we flew back to Riyadh. The students made a lot of memories coming to this country. They actually enjoyed their time. They learned new culture, changed some negative perceptions, and had hopes and dreams along with the people of this country. I thought that women could be, couldn't show like the little bit of their ankles and someone would shout at them. I thought it was a lot worse than it actually is. I think that the news that I had from Brazil were things that were happening like 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And I see that things are changing. From my perspective, I, I didn't know much coming in to the country. I think you obviously had like studied a lot more about the country and stuff like that. I'd only kind of seen what the media portrayed the country as and like stuff like that so I, I had a few concerns and I wasn't sure um, what it was going to be like etc etc but after coming here and like seeing um, everything being the people experiencing the culture like that's obviously changed a lot for me. I was uh, very um, worried about uh, security matters and about human rights plans I mean everywhere in the in the daily life and I was quite surprised from the very beginning of my trip since I arrived at the airport of Riyadh about uh, the, the contact I could um, get from people I, I would meet especially at, starting as I said at the airport with the guy from the immigration who started to speak to me in French and very welcoming with me that was my first uh, 
Saudi Arabia at the moment. Well, before Saudi Arabia, I didn't coming here. I didn't really know too much about it. I always connected it. Being an American, it's always connected with our um, war in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and I always thought of Saudi Arabia as being connected with that and kind of a warlike state. Um, but coming here, people are generally very um, friendly to me. I've had nothing but good experiences with the people here. So I knew that through Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's reforms that the role of women in society was expanding. Um, and I assumed that maybe perhaps things had been happening before, but after speaking with some of the women and just other people involved in this trip, it became very clear that women's role in Saudi Arabian society has been evolving for a long time and that basically making it official through these policy reforms was just kind of, it, it was about time for it to happen. When we think about Saudi Arabia, we always think about the religion, the Islam, and uh, I mean, I was talking to this girl about my favorite TV show, and it was her favorite TV show, and it's, it's something that we don't think about. We have so many things in common. We don't think about that when you think about a different country. Honestly, the Women's Forum kind of blew my mind, and it's because I had been reading up on Saudi Arabia before I came because, you know, that's what we do. We try to, like, you know, figure stuff about, about the country we're going to visit so we're not ignorant. And um, the stuff that I found were found to be just not even true, completely false. Or um, I was led to believe, like, from, my, from what I was reading, and I was trying to read things that were, like, accredited and unbiased. It was just talking about how, like, women didn't have rights. And it was ta I met women who had, like, represented themselves amongst men, or women who don't even have to get, have, um, like, a male's permission except for their passport every five years to travel. So, like, everything that I had seen and everything that I had read, like, was just proven to be false you know but a lot of a lot what's interesting to me is that I did get all of my questions answered and I did um, I was able to ask every question that I wanted to ask on this trip yeah I found it really inspiring to meet with some of the women especially um, the one woman who had worked in her local um, council as like a magistrate I thought that was really interesting that she had done that um, and even hearing personal stories about how how excited they were to finally be able to drive and obtain their driver's license. And also something that I didn't know was how much had been going on behind the scenes, even without um, influence from Mohammed bin Salman and other governmental representatives, that um, it wasn't just the men in government pushing for these rights, it was, it actually came from the women um, who were really pushing for years and years to change things in this country. So it was really inspiring to see how much they had achieved. It's very different for me as a travel photographer and travel influencer. It's very important for me that not a lot of people has been here before. So we have this very unique opportunity of showing uh, Saudi Arabia as a destination and soon many people will be able to come. I probably enjoyed Jeddah the most just because we got to go out on the boat and go in the Red Sea, which is somewhere that like I'd heard a lot about but never actually been to and I didn't know it existed like that. Like it was so it was so different to what I expected, but like it exceeded my expectations. So I think I had the most fun there. And then second to that would obviously be the desert. I think like it was just a fun time for me. And I really enjoyed meeting with uh, local Saudi students from Jeddah and Riyadh all together at one place, um, learning about science and technology. And then today we met with professors from various universities in Riyadh talking about um, for Saudi policy. I really enjoy talking with these um, young Saudis. To me, I think it was really special to be able to come on this trip because, you know, not everybody can afford it. I know I wouldn't have been able to travel anywhere outside of the U.S. like with my financial situation. So like I really appreciate, you know, Gateway KSA and the Faisal Center for trying to make this not only a touristy experience, but a learning experience as well. The whole trip has shown me that Saudi Arabia is changing and that there are um, like plans, whether it be Vision 2030 or just um, like a really young generation that's growing up and like learning new things and changing Saudi Arabia. So I know that I want to come back just to see what's in the works. People may look closely and see only differences. They may make prejudgmental ideas, 
And like Nelika said, the only way to learn about Saudi Arabia is that if you actually come and visit it. And there is no better way to conclude other than by the words of His Royal Highness, Prince Turki Faisal. Um, our biggest uh, attraction in the kingdom is that we don't have anything to hide. Uh, and so um, uh, we present ourselves with our uh, attractions, but also with our faults. And we recognize that as human beings, uh, we must all have faults. We, we try to rectify them when they're pointed out to us, whether by friends or by enemies. And as I mentioned, and the fact that we're willing to, to uh, host uh, people from different backgrounds uh, to come and, and see for themselves without any uh, intended uh, guidance or, um, or direction from, from the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies is the best way to get them to open their, not only their eyes, but also their minds and their hearts. And uh, hopefully that will be reflected when they go back to their countries and, and talk about Saudi Arabia. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing, of course, with your television uh, channel is documenting this experiment. Because it is very important for us that a, a wider audience uh, can get to know uh, what it is like to host uh, foreigners in your own land and be uh, not only hospitable but also open and um, uh, engaging with them. Saudi Arabia uh, has set for itself a course which is defined as Vision 2030. Um, the King, King Salman, uh, has uh, uh, announced this decision when he became King a couple of years ago. He uh, uh, delegated the uh, responsibility of implementing uh, this Vision 2030 to the Crown Prince, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And uh, the uh, excitement that has been generated by the announcement um, has consumed, I would say, the majority of the Saudi population. And although uh, those who continue to think of it as addressed only at people who are 30 years or younger because Saudi society is made up nearly 70% of uh, 30 years or younger people. Uh, someone like myself, uh, whom I consider to be a senior citizen, uh, are equally enthused and excited by the ambition uh, of uh, Vision 2030. I'm not going to say farewell to, to anybody. I'm going to say um, au revoir, as the French say, or uh, um, come back again and, and see us as many times as you like.